um, children who are who cannot go to a drive but become agitated during their um, stay in the ED or on the ward. So, question: um, Does suicide actually affect um, children who are coming to um, children's hospitals around the country? Is this a big issue? Um, yes, it is. Um, the the ED visits and admission rates for suicidal thoughts and attempts. Um, have almost doubled at children's hospitals nationally from 2008 to 2015. And currently, suicide is the second leading cause of death for children ages 10 to 24. Um, so there has been research on this looking at um, the challenges of caring for young people who are suicidal in medical settings. Um, some information that's been collected from research is um, that medical staff feels like sometimes they don't really have the skills to deal with kids who are suicidal. Um, obviously, there's just general stressors in terms of staff shortages and demand of services. Um, and now this is just like one other thing for you guys to have to deal with. Um, caring for um, kids who are suicidal, sometimes that leads to a higher sense of burnout. Um, for medical staff and feeling like they're not um, low accomplishment because they don't feel like they, they're effective in, in knowing what they're dealing with. Um, however, um, research has shown if, if knowledge base is able to be increased for caring for kids who are suicidal, that actually the staff attitudes um, end up being more positive and they feel more effective um, in caring for these patients. So, on the other side, um, what have um, suicidal um, youth said about their experience being in a medical setting? Um, and that's found that um, in looking at children who've gone to the emergency room um, after suicide attempt or self harm behaviors, they report feeling that like they felt humiliated. Um, they felt um, there was a lack of empathy. This is their perception. Um, they felt like there was hostility. Um, and anger directed towards them, and when they felt that um, they were less entitled or um, less legitimate um, as needing care in these settings. So, um, uh, I know this is like really confusing because we throw these terms around. Um, suicidal behavior, um, I'm sorry there's this delay on um, what my screen is showing and what one of the catches up the Zoom. There it goes. Sorry. Um, so, um, suicidal behavior um, occurs on the continuum. So, um, I don't have a light that works, but um, there's a low intent to die, which is the self harm behaviors like cutting, and then that goes all the way to high intent to die, which is actually having an attempt, and then the, um, the outcome being all avoiding the actually committing suicide. Um, and then there's both attempts to die and there's an unintentional suicide, maybe overdose of something that you didn't know was actually potentially lethal. Um, and that may be actually end up being lethal or it could not be lethal at all. So you might hear us throw these terms around self harm and self injurious behavior, suicidal behavior. Um, that's because it's all a continuum, and kind of our job as the mental health clinicians are to figure out where this patient is on the continuum. So um, I wanted to, um, hopefully the video works, um, talking about um, self-harm, self-injurious behavior um, to give you guys more information about it. If this works. Not working. I don't know. I just see a lock up there, uh, a, an icon of a lock, like this. Uh, I think that's the presentation. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. It's not that important. Um, so, <laughs> um, this is just giving you more information about. Um, uh, self injurious behavior, self harm. So that includes things like cutting, um, which is the most common type of self harm behavior. Um, and that could include using anything, anything, um, nails, razors, knives, anything 
Um, people can be very creative. Um, and self injurious behavior, behavior also includes things like hurting yourself by um, burning yourself. Um, sometimes people use cigarettes um, or even um, unfortunately stabbing oneself. Um, again, um, we have to try to figure out as mental health clinicians what's the intent of this behavior. It could be to end one life, someone's life, but most of the time it's actually not intended to be suicidal. Um, and um, if someone can actually have a positive, ad positive experience with their treatment um, and they feel like the staff is helping them, um, then both sides can feel like this was an effective and useful interaction. Um, but it can't just be overwhelming, like, why did you do that to yourself? Okay. So, sorry, this like this delay. Okay, there it goes. Um, so there's actually a cycle of self-harm um, behaviors, um, and the point of this whole slide is to really understand that um, A, it's a cycle, um, and B, it can keep continuing unless it's um, interrupted. Um, so the cycle starts with um, the young person feels a lot of negative thoughts um, by whatever's going on in their life, whatever whatever, whatever's going on in their life. Um, and um, because they're feeling that way, that might cause them to go to point B, where they end up being very distressed and frightened. Okay, I don't know why that just happened. <laughs> um, Suicide as far as like certain populations in you know in regard to the population we see here at Children's Hospital Oakland. Um, you know, what are the numbers or if you know um, that it affects primarily in regard to like race and ethnicity? Um so um, it, it occurs amongst all um, races, ethnicity, socioeconomic groups. Um, the actual suicide rate right now um, and attempts, um, the main increase is actually due to um, teens of color. Um, so um, most of the increase is related to that population currently over the past, I would say, three years or so. Do you feel like there's a reason for that? Or does it speak up? Does the research speak on the reason why? Yeah. I don't. I, I I haven't found any answers. Okay. Um. But definitely, um, the younger population in the U.S. is more diverse than the older population. So that might be a reason why. But there hasn't been any data I've seen about the reasons why. Um. It came back and then it went away. Yeah, just yeah, don't don't leave. <laughs> um, okay. So um, so we move from feeling very distressed, um, and um, we can even feel numb, and then we move to um, kind of the critical point where the person in C they get very panicked. Um, and then they have this very, very strong urge to self-harm. Um, so um, this is a key point. This is kind of like the last point to intervene before we go over to the edge, which is in D, where the, um, the child actually does self-harm. Um, and when they do that, it actually can um, help in their experience um, in controlling these feelings of um, panic and um, sadness. Um, and actually, after they do that, they feel a sense of relief in the ED. Um, and unfortunately, that's when they come to the ED. Um, so the kind of almost like the crisis is somewhat over, and now we have to get to kind of preventative of having the cycle not continue. But the, but it actually happened. The crisis happened, and they're actually feeling less distressed than they were before they cut. 
Um, so, however, what we are dealing with, they may feel a lot of shame and guilt about what happened um, by the time they do present to the ED, um, and they're having a lot of um, negative feelings about themselves, about their behavior. Um, and again, so we want to intervene so the cycle doesn't continue and they start doing it again. Um, I really like this quote that I um, came across um, with this guy who's like, he's just a lay person. Um, he um, decided to intervene and talk down people who were um, trying to attempt suicide in Australia at this area that's kind of like the Golden Gate Bridge where people go to um, commit suicide. And he actually interviewed and stopped 160 people or just from um, attempting suicide and just talking them down. And his words of wisdom from his experiences, um, never be afraid to speak to those who you feel are in need. Always remember the power of a simple smile, a helping hand, and a listening ear and kind word. So we can all do that, right? Um, I don't think any of my videos are going to work. Um, keep moving on, it's not working. Um, it's a good video, but it's not working. Um, Thank you. 
Wednesday. It's Wednesday. It's Wednesday at someone's house. Please, it's not Lisa's house. Yeah. Right. She lives by my house. Oh, perfect. Do you live on the creek? No. Uh, oh, yeah. She's a CRI. It's 11 to 5, 3 or 4. Yeah. One of those things. So it's night shift. She's like, I'm going to go to the She's such a force in those four hours of, you know, PM shift to six. I think it's her day that she celebrates whoever she wants, no matter what she wants. I think it's her day. You can easily enter the wall if, if you don't look at the person and see the person. Yeah. If there's no picture, I, I try to request their friendship before I send it to them. Then I'm like, if 30 of my Understandings that will occur, and this is very important um, to communicate as much as possible. So there's not um, a build and build of. Sorry, misunderstanding. Um, you you guys are all healthcare professionals, so you know how to communicate in general. Um, and um, typically, because there's a lot of um, shame. Um, and fear of what the self harm and suicide attempt. Um, Sometimes the child might be more reserved and withdrawn than their usual personality. Um, these actions um, can be made more intensified if the patient perceives that you're being judgmental towards them, um, which could, you may not be judgmental, it might just be their perception because they are feeling very ashamed um, and guilty. Um, however, if they feel like you're being open, um, that may help them a lot. So, in terms of the communication um, specifics, um, important to use open-ended questions, which I'm sure everyone does already, uh, but specifically to try to um, start your questions with a what, um, when, how, where, um, and um, avoid asking questions like why Why did you do this? Why did you hurt yourself? Um, and instead, try to ask questions such as what What is it about self harm or suicide attempt that helps you? Um, to try to understand from the child's perspective why they're engaging in these behaviors. Um, avoid um, asking. Um, uh, sorry. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I'll go back. You can you can um, ask them about questions, the things that you already know from the chart. Like if you know about their specific attempts, it's okay to ask them. I heard that you're feeling a little bit better now based on what 
um, your doctor wrote in the charts. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Or I heard you're having a hard time in school. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Because um, then they feel that you actually care about them and you're actually doing some research about them. Um, and um, try to recognize your own feelings about the situation because um, that comes into play about how you interact with the patient as well. Okay, so please tell me this, uh, uh, this video is going to work now. So let's try it. <coughs> You can try um, asking them to talk about how they're feeling using a scale of one to ten. Um, so if they should kind of shrug their shoulders or they said they feel bad, asking them um, to put on a scale of one to ten, and then asking what can we do to um, increase your feelings more positively by one point. Um, also, if they don't want to talk, you can try giving them um, writing utensils, papers, crayons. Um, pencils um, and saying you just write this down on the piece of paper how you're feeling and I can get it later or someone else can read it later um, as a way for them to be able to communicate without um, verbally speaking. Um, if you do think that they say that they're feeling fine but you think that they, they don't look fine, it's okay to confront them very gently and say, I notice that you seem really distressed um, even though you're saying you're feeling okay, um, could you let me know what you think can help you feel a little bit better? Um, if you're presented with a um, difficult situation such as um, someone who just harmed themselves saying that um, oh, um, they're feeling like they want to hurt themselves again. Um, it's good to just ask for clarification of that, what that means um, and letting them know that even though you're not a therapist that you can have someone kind of talk to them um, who is a mental professional. Um, but don't um, try to approach the situation directly um, and asking them to explain exactly what they mean um, because they could just be like, I'm thinking about it, but I'm 100% not going to do it. I just feel that way, um, which is more reassuring as opposed to they're thinking about it um, and they're planning, they have plans to do it. 
Um, it's important to provide as much validation as you can because, like I said, the child is usually going to feel shame and guilt about being in the hospital after their attempts. Um, so, um, this is like a disaster. <laughs> um, um, it's important to let them know um, that you um, take what happens to them seriously and you want to make sure that they're getting help. Um, and, you, and it's very important that, they, that um, we're in the hospital able to keep them safe. Um, letting them know that they did the right thing by coming to the ED or telling their parents about their attempt. Um, and that, we, that this is a safe place for them to um, let us know their thoughts and feelings, and we'll try to help them as much as possible. And even if you specifically have your expertise, you know how to get help from other people in the hospital who are experts. Um, and again, don't be afraid to um, not, don't be afraid to talk about the suicide. Um, because you're afraid of doing something wrong, that's likely going to result in the child's feeling more stigmatized if you're not talking about the babies and mother here in the hospital. Um, if they have, um, if they, some of our children have a history of different suicide attempts um, and are suffering behaviors, so because they have all this experience with it, sometimes it's good to ask them what's helped you in the past. When you've done this, what kind of what are what 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 are your triggers that you know about in the past? And some of them are very good at telling you all about that, and some of them need more help in getting that um, all sorted out. Um, uh, we don't. We're working on getting more things available, um, like stress balls or different things to alleviate boredom and um, decrease stress. Um, but um, if they, their family brings in things for them um, that can help them reduce stress, please, um, if it's safe, um, allow them to use it because it, obviously it is very boring in the hospital sometimes and that um, provides more opportunities to um, cause problems. Um, what about something like a cell phone? So we have, depending on what's going on, um, usually there's rules against that. Um, especially if you're getting on social media or texting people who might be triggers. You know, <coughs> who might be triggers for the cell phone behavior in the first place. Um, okay, we kind of talked about this already. Um, definitely um, child life can be very helpful with music, music therapy in terms of providing um, outlets to relieve boredom. Um, so definitely you should try to get them involved as much as, much as they're able to be involved with these patients to provide the distractions. Um, so um, as much as you can, um, because some, these, some patients are very sensitive, um, when you are in inter interactions with them, like your shift is going to change, um, to let them know what's happening, like, OK, I have to leave now. I'll see you in the morning, um, because their mom might go to different places, like you don't like them, and that's why you don't come to the room anymore. Um, again, they're, some of them are very hypersensitive, um, so it's just good to explain everything that's going on with them. Um, uh, again, um, even though you're not a therapist, um, you are able to listen, smile, um, ask if someone needs help. Um, and just letting the child know that they can, even though you're not a therapist, that you are someone that um, can listen to them and can um, follow them to the right places. Okay. Um, as much as you are aware in terms of if someone's on, um, came in after a suicide attempt, letting them know the BERT team will be there to talk to them, um, possibly the next day, and that this team is going to um, do their assessment and determine whether or not what's the next steps in their treatment. Um, because sometimes because they just don't know what's going on and that causes more anxiety. Um, and if you don't know what's going on, like, no, I don't know. Um, but as soon as I know, I'll get back to you. Um, when you're changing shifts, 
um, to let the next person you're handing off to know whatever history you know about the child, whatever triggers that you noticed. Um, and also, if you, if particularly if the child is very um, shy or introverted, to let them, um, you do the introduction to the next person you're handing out care to. Um, to let them know, oh, this person is safe, I've, I've worked with them, they know a little bit about you. Um, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, so I work in the ICU here. It's an open unit. Um, and just based on what you've said so far about being a little more transparent um, so that they don't feel stigmatized or alienated, what is your feeling about giving report in a place where they can actually hear you give report so they know what you're telling the other person um, versus doing report out of earshot? Um, like, does that seem more secretive or does it give them an opportunity if they hear what you say to maybe correct any misunderstandings or let them know what we know or? I think it depends on the content that you're handing off. I, I think probably in most cases what you're going to say in front of the child would probably be um, a lot more edited mm -hmm. than what you would say, um, you know, to whoever you're handing off care to. Um, but I think something just simple like, you know, um, oh, this is such and such, I'm taking care of you. Um, you know, little Ashley, she's here after suicide attempts. Um, we're still, um, she's still being assessed by the mental health service to decide what's the next best. Okay. And then they can just read a note if they need more detail or you can help. Well, that's just like that the child knows that you, right. you, you tell that to whoever you're handing off. So they're not like sitting there like, do they even know I'm here because I like, you know, right. you're just a mental tunnel. Um, which we know, right. of course you know that, but they might not know right. at 12. But that's what happens. Okay, um, so um, this is just a little very brief snapshot. Um, I know there's a lot of staff that wonders what happens when the children leave um, here, what happens to them, and um, that's a very complicated question. Um, we, are, we are doing assessments on how they're doing right now and also considering their history and also what kind of supports they have outside the hospital. Um, so it, the plan may change by the day, by the hour, um, and also the child's presentation may change by the minute. Um, so it's very variable. Um, but the bigger um, issue, as you are aware of, most likely, is that there's a shortage of um, psychiatric beds in the whole country. Um, California is particularly impacted. And also, when you go to beds of, um, for people under 18, that's specifically very impacted and very limited. Um, so uh, I just want to show you guys this map um, to let you know out of the 58 counties in California, only the ones in orange are have any beds for um, anyone under 18. Wow. Um, yeah. Why so many in Southern California? <laughs> Is that money? Um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, so it's very limited. Um, out of our eight counties in Northern California, um, including Alameda County. Um, there's only 12 hospitals around here in the eight counties that have beds for children under 18. So that's about 250 beds in eight counties. Um, so not a lot. Um, there's only four hospitals in the eight counties that have beds for children who are 12 or, or under 12 years old. So very few. Um, and then once they get to the hospital, the length of stay is only three to five days. So potentially they could be in the ER or the or hospital waiting for a bed longer than they're actually hospitalized in patient units. So I'm saying all this to say that that's why kids who you think need to be in hospital are not going to the patient like hospitals because it's very um, limited, the resource. And also, what they may be getting out of it is very limited because the stays are very short. Um, and then this is just um, 
letting you know in terms of the number of site um, beds for children um, since 2009 um, have been basically going down. Um, and the need um, would be to have um, about 50 beds per 10,000 um, people population. And in 2017, the number of beds are only um, 7.6. So um, just so you have a sense of the landscape out there. <laughs> Um, so this really is a resource that is not available to a lot of our, our patients, unfortunately. Um, and also, again, back to the length of stay, questionable how helpful it really could, is in some cases because it's a short um, stay. Yes? What happened in 2010? Yeah. 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 I do not know. It sounds like that looks like a hospital open and they didn't do very well because they closed. <laughs> um, okay, so um, in the time I have left, I want to talk a little bit about, um, and this is obviously a way bigger conversation about dealing with agitation and in kids in the hospital who they are presenting suicidal, but they may have some degree of agitation that arises during their um, ED stay or inpatient stay. Um, so there could be a, a lot of different reasons behind it, um, including something organic um, that's going on with them from their, medical, from their uh, medical condition as a result of their suicide attempt, or could be emotional. Um, but some of the signs of um, them ramping up with their agitation are things like um, tapping their feet, bringing their hands, pulling their hair, fiddling, um, being fidgety. Um, they may say things like repeatedly, like, I want to get out of here, I need to get out of here now. Um, and so that gives us signs that they're ramping up um, and we need to do something to try to de-escalate them. Um, so in terms of the de-escalation process, it sort of starts with um, personal space. So we really want to make sure that we're at least two arms um, length distance away from patients um, that are agitated. Um, the sitter should be, if there's a sitter in the room, um, they should be sitting closest to the exit, whatever exit there is, um, because you don't want to get, if the patient's fleeing, get between the patient and their escape route. Um, and um, while the door remains open, um, I think that's um, for privacy because the door sometimes will absolutely not lock it. Um, we don't do that here. Um, definitely um, having some kind of communication system with the other staff about how um, a sitter or whoever's in the room would let someone outside the room know if they need help, additional help. Um, and if a patient is physically coming at you, then get out of the way. But if they're just Speaking, um, try to get help, but don't leave them alone. Kind of by themselves. Um, also, part of the escalation is try to reduce fear um, for the patient experiencing if he was being threatening. Um, so, part of that is having open body language, um, have your hands visible, um, try not to go like this, fold your arms, because some people might experience that as being threatening. Um, try to um, be sort of like off at the side of them instead of like directly in front of them because that's less confrontational. Um, and then for some people, they get very triggered by very intense eye contact that's looking directly at them. Uh, so people experience that as threatening. Um, so uh, in terms of the escalation cycle of being um, agitated, um, the uh, ramping up, um, they might be making faces, raised voices, you talk about the pacing, um, looking at their watch, and then we get into a more dangerous zone where they start cursing, um, speaking loudly, uh, making threats. Um, so that's our opportunity to do some kind of intervention, and then um, kind of everything's uh, out the window when we get to throwing things, punching, um, hitting, spitting. 
Um, so there's this idea that um, we want to approach the patient and meet with whatever emotion that they're experiencing, if we can identify what that is. So if we feel like they're acting out of a lot of fear and they're scared, try to be reassuring. Um, if depending if you have a relationship with the patient, you can touch the very light on you know, the shoulder. That's okay. Um, uh, try to, if you have information about the next steps, provide it to them. That might make them feel less fearful. Um, however, if you think that they're um, reacting out of a lot of anger, um, you want to get distance between them. Um, stand up to let them know you can escape. Um, try to speak very firmly, um, not yelling, but firmly using very short sentences that are very direct. Um, and then, of course, ask um, security to stand by, um, even if you're not calling a full bird, but just asking security. You could ask security to come. Yes? Oh, um, okay. So, <laughs> bird thing. We don't always have bird available now, right? Yes. It's limited. Yes. Um, and on the weekends, we don't have psychiatry coming in on the weekends, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Okay. Why? I just. I'm wondering what we're going to do as a nursing staff who's not trained on the weekends to pray for Monday. What? Pray for Monday. Pray for Monday. <laughs> okay. Um, continue the de escalation. Um, try to talk to the patients, which we've covered. Um, find a way to validate or agree with what they're saying if there is something to agree with. Um, and you might have to repeat yourself several times um, for it to sink in. Um, and it generally takes anywhere from um, five to ten minutes to, to, to de-escalate someone verbally um, if it is going to be a successful um, de-escalation. So it's time, but it's not actually that much time. Um, so it's it's good if you are trying to verbally just like um, someone that just one person tries to do it and not like several people talking to the patient at the same time because that can be overwhelming. Um, if you are um, trying to get the patient but you're not the one who's been directly working with them, um, to make sure to introduce yourself, ask for their name, um, explain to them that you want them to be safe and everyone else in the um, area to be safe. Um, and then let them know what the expectations are, if that's to sit back down in their bed, if that's to unclench their fist, whatever it is, not shout, um, let them know that very clearly. Um, I think we talked about this, but you may have to repeat yourself. Um, Okay, so again, about like the, the reasons under the escalation. Um, if someone's very sad, try to offer them some hope, which might be, hey, you're not going to be in the hospital forever. Probably by tomorrow, you'll know what your um, what the plan is. I don't know right now, but you're not. No one stays in the hospital forever. Um, if they're very scared, let them know that we're not out here to hurt them. Um, if the person is just aggressive, um, try to find out what, what they're trying to get out of being aggressive and threatening. Um, so for example, if they say, I want to get out of here, um, you, could, you could respond by saying, I want that for you too. We don't want you to be here any longer than, than necessary. How can we work together to get you out of here? Um, body language, nod your head to, show, to let them know that you're listening to them. Um, Sometimes it's good to let them know that you're listening to what they're saying by repeating, paraphrasing back to them what they're talking about. Um, and you could say, saying, okay, let me just make sure I have, I understand this right, what you're asking for, what you're demanding right now. Um, you don't have to argue with them, but just show them that you understand what their concerns are and um, try to avoid making promises that you can't keep, such as saying you're gonna be discharged tomorrow, um, because we don't know that. <laughs> Most of the time. Um, okay. Um, so this is kind of agree where you can. Um, so if someone says things like they feel like they're being disrespected in the hospital, people treating them badly, 
you can agree with them that um, none of them being treated badly, but that you think that everyone should be treated with respect, that that's, that's a valid point. Um, and if they're upset about things like I have to wait for so long to get assessed, um, to let them know, yes, other people will be upset too. Um, so you're not saying they're right for their behavior, you're just showing that you understand that that's frustrating. Um, and even little simple things like that can de-escalate someone. Um, and then there's time to get to set limits, right? Um, so, you know, you, you, um, hurting, hurting someone is not okay, and we, we can't tolerate that. Um, if they're doing things that are frightening or threatening, letting them know that, that you're here to help them, not to hurt them. Um, if you curse, um, that's very frightening. Um, and you need to stop it. Just very direct. Um, and then we kind of talk about this little things that everyone knows how to do if someone's having a hard time, offering them things like um, possibly making a phone call for them if, not, if they don't have access to their cell phone, if that's allowed, giving them little snacks. Um, and then again, we want to make sure we, we don't promise things that we can't deliver on, like you'll get your cell phone back tomorrow. Um, briefly, um, talking about um, de-escalation as um, offering medication as an option, um, that the goal is just, just to calm them down in the moment. Um, you might bring up the subject by asking them, have they tried this before, taking medicines to calm down? Um, letting them know you think they might benefit from a little medicine right now, they're in a behavioral emergency, we need that you be safe. Um, we try obviously not to give IM medication and um, restrain people, but sometimes it actually is helpful to say, we need medicine right now to calm down, would you prefer a shot or a pill? And sometimes that helps clarify the choices for people, if it's just bluntly said. Um, or if they will, if you will, you you know, you're getting to the point where they have to be restrained, like, no, you have to take medicine now, like, this isn't a debate. Um, this is what has to happen right now. Um, um, these are just other lines you can use in terms of offering medication. I see you're uncomfortable right now. Maybe you offer some medication. It's important to be calm so we can talk. Um, would you be willing to take some medication now? Um, so this, we kind of talked a little bit about the um, handing off care to um, the next person coming on to the care of the patient, um, that you want to make sure to communicate with them what's going on with the patient, their triggers, what's been helping to escalate them if that's been an issue in the past, and then just making sure to introduce the new staff coming on to the patient and to say goodbye that you're leaving because they may not know why you disappeared. Um, and they get personalized. So, I'm not going to go into detail with this, but this is kind of the um, uh, the national kind of pathways in the adopted for suicide screening um, that starts with the uh, um, universal suicide screening with the ASQ, um, which is going to be rolling out soon. Um, and then kind of go from there, start finding people into the rest of the categories. So, thank you. And I'm sorry for all the